Welcome to This Week in Creationism, number three. I'm your host, Joel Duff. Now, there's a lot going on in creationism this past week. Um, lots of interesting headlines. I've narrowed it down to just a couple that I'm going to focus on for this particular presentation. So let's get right to it. We're going to talk about Yellowstone super volcano eruptions um, and Ham rebuilding the Tower of Babel. Let's go right to Answers in Genesis, where yesterday there was a article posted there just entitled Yellowstone, and it's by Andrew Snelling. We saw Andrew Snelling last time on This Week in Creationism. He was being uh, hyped up by Ken Ham as having produced some groundbreaking research on the Grand Canyon, and he called Ken Ham called him a world-class geologist. Well, now this geologist comes back and has something to tell us about Yellowstone. This is actually published in Answers Magazine, which is more of their popular magazine that's, that's going uh, out to their general audience. Uh, and so it's not ne meant to be anything in depth, but what it is meant to do is sort of say, hey, you've probably heard of Yellowstone. You've heard that Yellowstone is a giant volcano. It's a huge caldera. Like it, when you're in Yellowstone, most of the park, and you're traveling around looking at these wonderful geysers and all the an wonderful animals there, you're inside of a caldera of, of an ancient volcano. Um, and there's always this persistent question, you know, could that volcano once again become active and blow its top again, and that would be catastrophic. Uh, and so he's going to address that particular concern from a young earth creationist perspective. Like, should you be worried about Yellowstone blowing its top uh, in the near future? Now, he is addressing what are some popular articles that come out like, you know, every six months or a year. I see a story about, uh, in this case, like here's a fairly recent one. Yellowstone sees 1000 earthquakes in July. Super eruption to come. Right. Oh, well, maybe there's going to be, you know, maybe this is the, the, the four bearings of a, of a new explosion that's coming soon. Now, the conventional geologists say, yeah, sure, there's probably going to be another very large eruption in, the, in, the, um, in that area in the future. Um, but tens of thousand years probably is, is sort of the, the rough estimate is when the next one would be due. And these uh, deformations of the ground and like some of the lakes that are rising and falling. Yes, there, there are things happening underneath Yellowstone, but this is not, not a sign of imminent eruption, uh, at least not any significant eruption. Nonetheless, the question is, could it happen again? But then also, what happened in the past and how do you fit these massive eruptions into the short time frame or the chronology of young earth creationism? So he talks a little bit about, he introduces the idea of, of that there's um, been eruptions at Yellowstone and that there have been massive eruptions at Yellowstone. He admits that, talks about massive amounts of ash that have fallen across large portions of North America uh, and then relates that to, and I'm going to start here before I get to talking about Yellowstone, he relates that to uh, well, he, he explains why we shouldn't be that worried as well, how would, where did all these massive explosions come from? Well, he explains that as being the remnants or remains of plate tectonics. And remember, in young earth creationism, plate tectonics are real, but they're highly sped up, right? All the continents have moved around, yes, but they've moved around just in the last 4,500 to maybe 5,000 years. So at the beginning of the Noahic flood, 4,350 years ago, uh, these plates began to shift and move very, very quickly as the sediment was being moved all around the world. And as these plates moved quickly, th that caused, you know, new mountains to form and volcanoes were forming during the flood. But then toward the end of the flood, when things were settling down and these continents were still moving, that's when he would say that you had these massive eruptive events where you had volcanic events like these calderas in, in, um, in, uh, in uh, sorry, Yellowstone, but also all up and down the West Coast, right? There's all kinds of volcan uh, volcanoes there. And then, of course, the Hawaiian Islands. And the Hawaiian Islands are a favorite of people to talk about. The Hawaiian Islands are held up as one of the primary examples demonstrating the, the great antiquity of the Earth because of how they are developed over long periods of time in a succession or a series of uh, a chain of islands. But his explanation for that chain of islands is that... Uh, that, that, that it was a mantle plume, that there was this, this hot area, you know, under the crust that was puncturing up and pushing up uh, lava 
up onto the surface of the crust. But because the crust was moving really fast, these things were like coming up, coming up, coming up, and making new islands, and the islands were moving off, you know, at, enor at incredible rates, like, you know, new islands forming, you know, every, you know, couple years or something like that, or maybe it gives them 100 years to develop before they move on and the next island comes up. And, you know, then he says that the, the plates slowed down to their present rates because, of course, we can measure the rates that plates are moving today and they move, you know, the, the rate of approximately the growth of a fingernail, right? Very, very, very slowly. Um, and his, his, he throws in this thing as the plates slowed down, the uh, Pacific plate lingered over the hot spot and thus more eruptive, uh, more eruptions produce bigger islands. That's why the biggest islands uh, stands where the plume is today. He's saying that one of the biggest Hawaiian islands is at the is where the active island is today, and it's the largest because the plate slowed down and now it's had more time to accumulate more volcanic material, producing this much larger island. Oh, all right, this is where the the well the problems began before that in this article. Um, this oversimplified view of rapid plate tectonics that doesn't account for enormous amounts of data that have been collected um, sounds kind of like a, a, you know, a plausible scenario if you don't know any geology. But what bothers me particularly about this, this statement is, let's, let's move on here to my next slide. He's saying that the Hawaiian Island, you know, the current Hawaiian Island is the largest island and so all the other ones are smaller because they grew during a time, they were developed during a time in which uh, the plates were moving along very quickly, not giving as much time for the accumulation of volcanic material, so therefore not as large as volcanoes. Well, to start right off with, um, it's not even a true statement that the current Hawaiian or the, the present Hawaiian island or the main island Hawaii is necessarily the largest uh, segment of the Hawaiian island chain. It looks like it is, and certainly there's more mass above the ocean in the main island of Hawaii, which is right here on the left, on the right side of your frame, uh, than the other islands. So what you're looking at is the chain of islands that, that represents the, the main uh, chain, Hawaiian chain. Um, it didn't take me very long, and I already knew that this was the case, but I, I went and looked up a, a couple examples. This, this article from 2004, Time Variation and Igneous Volume Flux of the Hawaiian Emperor Hotspot Seamount Chain. And the upshot of this was is that about 20 million years ago, out here sort of in the middle, um, the, the calculated amount of, of magma that was brought up to the surface, all right, producing the mountains that are there is roughly equal to the, the volume that was being produced right now in producing the current Hawaiian Islands. There are times when there was less, but it fluctuated over time, and that the total mass of some of these other mountains is not that far off from the current Hawaiian Islands. Uh, also, the reason they're below the surface is because the whole crust has deformed and sunk down over time because it's not as warm, and so it sinks over time. Those islands, even though they're not above sea level, are actually massive mountains that are below sea level, and the total mass of those mountains is not that far off from the current islands. And remember, the current islands also haven't been able to erode, whereas these islands have had lots of time to erode, and therefore some of the mass is actually gone through erosion as well. So it's it's not even he's trying to give a, you know like this this generic idea that the flood everything happened really really fast and then the plates slowed down and then because they've slowed down the the act you know places like the Hawaiian Islands have had more time to accumulate material except that they're really not haven't haven't really accumulated that much more material than other places um, and now so he's going to try to apply this somehow to the um, the hot spot that sits underneath the volcanic uh, caldera of Yellowstone. So we come back here and we see, in contrast, the super eruptions that track the Yellowstone plume in North America became progressively smaller until the most recent eruptions occurred in Yellowstone itself. And I'm going to show you a map of that in a moment, and that's not even really all that accurate as well, that the eruptions have become that much smaller. Um, and we know that all these post-flood super eruptions, because their ash was deposited, we know that's the case because 
their ash was deposited on present day flood land surfaces before people migrated to Babel and then arrived in North America. So what's he talking about here? He's saying that uh, I acknowledge that these massive eruptions. Hey, let's talk. Let's show you what those massive eruptions are. He shows the uh, two different. Well, actually, three different in this. This figure on the left is from his paper on answers in Genesis. And he's showing that Mount St. Helens was a tiny eruption, you know, um, very small in terms of output compared to past eruptions like these two from Yellowstone. So this one from Yellowstone, the Lava Creek ash uh, and the Huckleberry Ridge ash were absolutely inc massive explosions uh, laying down hundreds of feet of ash nearby, but then uh, centimeters to feet of ash across a large portion of Western North America. Um, and so these large explosions he's claiming occurred after the flood, right? And, and, and admittedly, he kind of has to admit that because these ash layers uh, would have been destroyed by floodwaters. And they're, where you find these ash layers, they're very clear, distinct ash layers. And so there's no mixing of that ash uh, in some places with other sediments and other material. Uh, that can really only be explained in, a, in what's called an aerial environment, right? Not not an aqueous environment in the water, and so he's trying to he's trying to find room in his chronology. Which remember, the flood occurred only four thousand three hundred fifty years ago. So these massive explosions that that laid ash over the entire western U.S. in his in his chronology or in the young Earth chronology all occurred after the flood, but. They also occurred, as we see here, they occurred before people migrated from Babel. And the reason he's saying that is because there isn't any human remains in any of this ash. There's lots of animals and other critters in that ash, but not any human remains or artifacts uh, from, from human uh, uh, interaction in the environment. Now, the first thing I want to point out is that um, he is, in this article, he does mention that there are other Yellowstone explosions besides these two. But he doesn't tell his audience about all the numerous explosions that occurred in North America that must also fit into his chronology. So, for example, Valles Caldera down in New Mexico. Uh, I've stood I've stood just this past year inside that caldera, and it's really impressive to to see the ash layers around that region uh, that covered up all of Colorado with a layer of, of volcanic ash. And then you have Long Valley Caldera over in California. That also covered the entire area, including the area almost up to Yellowstone with volcanic ash. And then you have the various Yellowstone ashes uh, and so forth. So there's been many, many different sequential events, each one of these separated by time because we can see that there is a whole ecosystem that developed between each one. So forest and animals had to repopulate this entire area. Uh, or, you know, some may survived in some pockets, but they had to repopulate the whole area before the next explosion, which then uh, preserved them underneath that. So that speaks to a whole series of events occurring over a, a, a historical period. Uh, so um, I want to show you one other thing to show you just how impressive this is and how how difficult this is to fit into the young earth chronology this is uh, a picture from ashfall fossil beds in nebraska it's actually in um maybe sort of eastern nebraska um and you might be tempted to the, well, well i should tell you what this is this is uh, a, a whole herd of large herbivores uh, that was killed by uh, breathing in volcanic ash. All right, their lungs are full of this volcanic ash, which killed them, and then they're preserved in that ash um, in really great detail. And you might be tempted to think, oh, well, this maybe these are these are the animals that were killed by the Yellowstone explosion. Well, no, these were killed at an er during an earlier uh, super volcano uh, eruption uh, that occurred. You know, about I think it was I think it's 11 million years ago in in conventional chronology. Um, what I like about this particular picture is it makes you think. Okay, there was actually herds of animals that existed in North America when this super eruption occurred. This super eruption, this volcanic ash, lies below all the volcanic ash 
that Andrew Snelling talks about in his article, right? His huge super eruptions from from uh, from uh, Yellowstone that then blanketed the Western U.S., including Nebraska. Those ash layers are on top of this ash layer, and this ash layer is on top of you know and killed a whole bunch of animals. Where did these animals come from? Well, in the young earth chronology, they had to have stepped off the ark, right? All of these animals here were probably just a couple animals that were on the ark. They had to depart from the ark. They had to travel all the way up to uh, Alaska, across the Bering Strait, come into North America, then propagate and populate the, uh, the, the Western Plains, right? To be present when that super volcano occurred. Um, but they had to do all that before man got there because there's no evidence that, 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 that any human beings were around at this particular time. So then now, I come back, now I come back to you know, Snelling only presents a very small little bit of the story to his audience. Now, he doesn't have a lot of room to tell the whole story, but he certainly gives the perception that, oh, we can explain Yellowstone. There were these you know, large explosions of, and he admits there were multiple super volcanic events that occurred. He thinks they occurred maybe in a few hundred years after the flood. Um, and they then caused this ash layer to be, to cover the whole area around there. But geologists know that that wasn't the only thing. That's the Yellowstone caldera. But if you back up, you'll find that there's an older large caldera, um, the Heiss uh, caldera, that's older, 6.6 .6 million years ago. Then you come back to Picabo Caldera, 10 million years ago. And then you come back to the Twin Falls Caldera. These are all in Idaho. And what you get is you get, you get a, a, a sequence of calderas that each one of them is dated to an older age. And the calderas are associated with massive amounts of ash uh, in, in various locations, right? All of these, resulted in many ash layers that built up a large segment of the, 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 the land in Idaho, Wyoming, uh, and northern Colorado. All of those resulted in ash that one would have to explain as being post-flood in origin. So Snelling has to explain all of those being present, and all of them probably at some, in some place have preserved some animals. So those animals also had to have gotten from the arc over to uh, this particular region. You see, I, it, it's hard to know where to stop. And, and there are one problem after another comes up when you start talking about this. Um, okay, I'll just say that if you wanna know more about all the issues that Yellowstone um, uh, brings up for young earth creationism, you should read uh, a series of articles that Kevin Nelstead has published on his uh, blog, uh, geochristian.com. Uh, uh, and there, uh, I think he summarizes it very well. The whole thing can be summarized as too many events, too little time, right? There's just way too many events that you have to squeeze into the extremely short chronology of young earth creationism. Again, if you had 10 super volcanoes, and that doesn't even include the other ones just from the, from the sequence that leads to Yellowstone, but there's also super volcanoes in California, New Mexico, and other areas that also are integrated into all of those different layers. You have animals in all those layers. You have different plants and forests that had grown up and lived during the time between all those. And yet Snelling wants to place all of that after the flood and somehow during uh, maybe the, you know, before the end of the Ice Age, which in, it, for them is just a few hundred to maybe a, at most a thousand years after the flood. So all of that chronology in a thousand years. And yet, um, you know, when you walk around that environment now, sure, you can find the ash, but uh, it, 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 it's, it's been, <laughs> it, it, it's, you would think, that the whole land of the West would still look kind of like a moonscape at this point, just a few thousand years later, uh, rather than completely grown over. Uh, all right, that's topic number one from Answers in Genesis. The other news story from Answers in Genesis is uh, the Ark 
and Encounter and the museum are groaning, right? They're groaning in the sense that uh, they've aged, especially the, the, the Creation Museum, right? It's, it's literally just gotten old and they're constantly revising it, but also they are having more visitors and they are. They've gotten a lot more visitation since they opened the Ark Encounter. And so they're planning new expansions and um, basically fixing it up. Right, so you, know, you can see what they've added to the top of the Answers in Genesis website, and that is we're going to have, you know, another fundraiser, right? We, 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 we're we going to try to raise $17 million to improve the ARC uh, encounter and the Creation Museum. What kind of things are they going to be adding? Well, they want to add a children's museum. They want to add uh, more facilities for doing teaching, uh, conferences, um, they want to have um, more gardens. Uh, they want to have a visitor center uh, that people can visit uh, even without going to the museum. Uh, that's all Creation Museum stuff. And then if we go and we look at what's happening at the uh, Ark Encounter, what you're seeing right here is the uh, one of the original plans. This was sort of like the, in one of the first press releases. This was their long-term vision for the Ark Encounter. And so you can see how the arc with the lake in front of it, that's, that's what exists today. And then they, they have built a, a, a large um, auditorium. And then behind the arc, which in this picture is trees, there's the, that's where the animals are. So it's not, it, it, this, this was just a, you know, a, like a hopeful vision. Um, they've changed their plans over time in terms of where they're going to put things. But what they are doing is now he's unveiled that he's going to build the Tower of Babel as a, as a as somehow a, a teaching tool for understanding racism uh, in our society today. And, you know, the whole aspect of, of race is something that Ken Ham speaks about a lot uh, and talks about the biblical understanding of, of racial, um, uh, racial equity and so forth. And so he's really played into that... Uh, issue in our in our society today of social justice and this this i'm sure that this um this new tower of babel is going to be a, his um evangelical um uh, how shall we put it here his his instrument for teaching what he believes is the biblical view of race um you know a lot of people poke fun at the whole tower of babel and building that and how that you know you know how building the tower of babel originally was not a good idea um, I'm, I'm not, I mean, that's fun to do, I guess, but um, I'm not opposed to the idea of building a representation of the Tower of Babel. However, I will be interested to see if they, he actually follows any advice from ancient Near East scholars about what it would, it would have looked like and what the purpose of it uh, was. So he, sh he should do a little reading up on John Walton and uh, uh, Ben Stanhope and a variety of others and maybe get some good advice rather than... Uh, than the types of things he's done so far, which are highly creative and for the most part, not really representative of the actual culture of the time. Um, and he's also building something like this first century village and he has like an area that's supposed to look like Jerusalem um, and uh, no signs of an aviary yet, but you get the idea. I mean, the Ark Encounter is a growing complex uh, and, you know, the idea, of course, is that, you know, the Ark itself is is an attraction. But once you've gone to it once, you may not be interested in coming back. But, you know, there's zip lines and there's other things to see. And as long as you keep on adding new things, you can hopefully get the same dollars returning over and over and over again. Um, you know, of course, there are new faces coming to the Ark Encounter. But uh, I think the audience is, is somewhat limited. There's only a certain number of people that are going to be... Um, that zealous for this particular message. And so you got to have the repeat buyer uh, coming back again in order to continue to uh, monetize this particular um, uh, this, this theme park, uh, shall we say. All right, so that's it for what's going on with the uh, with Answers in Genesis this last week. It's been a packed week. There's a number of other interesting articles there. I will probably be back for a part two for this week in creationism because there's also some interesting news from uh, Creation Ministries International, a little bit from uh, ICR, and there's a few other things going on in creationism. So I hope you'll return for that. 
Thanks a lot for listening. And if you enjoyed this content, please subscribe. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.